My talk today is about interfaces and orientation relationships between crystals. Now, we sometimes imagine a crystal to be a single descriptive term that describes the region where two crystals meet. Perhaps we imagine that there is some degree of disorder associated with that transition region. They're quite reasonable assumptions. Uh, but interfaces, in fact, have a significant degree of periodic structure, uh, a lot less than that associated with a perfect crystal, but nevertheless a clearly defined structure. And how do we know this? Well, we can observe the structure using techniques such as transmission electron microscopy. Now, to illustrate this, I will create an interface beginning with a single crystal and changing that into a bicrystal. So this slide shows, first of all, a single crystal. And what I'll do is I'll slice it along the middle and then tilt the two halves with respect to each other to create a bicrystal. So these dashed crystals are obviously in a different crystallographic orientation. And this would be the region of the boundary. But notice that by slicing and doing the tilting operation, uh, we've left quite a big gap over here. And that isn't what exists when we look at a boundary. There is no uh, macroscopic gap between the two crystals where they touch. So how do we cope with this? Uh, well, we could, we could put in planes of atoms into that thin wedge and a dislocation, of course, an edge dislocation is, of course, rather like an extra half plane which you insert to create the dislocation, to create the tilt between these adjacent planes. So we can imagine that that thin wedge, which we created by slicing a single crystal and then tilting the two halves uh, with respect to each other, actually consists of an array of dislocations which fill that gap that has been created. So let's have a look at that uh, schematically for our tilt boundary. Here is the same thing illustrated again, but now the gap is filled by stacking edge dislocations into the space that we created. So this is our interface, and you can see it now consists of a periodic array of edge dislocations and the dislocations have a Burgers vector B, and they are spaced a distance D apart in the plane of the interface. And this angle theta is the tilt between crystal one and crystal two. Now from this geometry, if I take, uh, if I draw a perpendicular here, then tangent of theta upon two would be equal to um, B over the distance d. So here we are, the relationship between the misorientation theta, the Burgers vector, and the spacing of these dislocations. So the larger the value of theta, the smaller will be d. In other words, we will have a larger number of dislocations arranged to fill in that thin wedge. Quite reasonable. If the tilt is very, very small, we can only insert uh, a finite amount of extra half planes. Okay, so um, we expect the interface to consist of arrays of dislocations, uh, and we define the misorientation by an axis that is pointing out of the plane of the board. And if we take that as a unit vector, uh, so a unit vector would have uh, components um, which are called direction cosines. Okay, so that means the cosines of the angle that the unit vector makes with your reference frame. Now, a unit vector has a magnitude of one, so only two of those direction cosines are independent, so we can define the tilt axis using just two direction cosines. Similarly, uh, an interface is actually defined by its normal, okay, normal to the plane of the interface, and once again, we need two further degrees of freedom to define the orientation of the interface between the two crystals. 
and the orientation relationship is described by the tilt axis and the angle theta. So that makes five degrees of freedom, two for the tilt axis, a unit vector describing the tilt axis, and third, the theta, which is the angle of the tilt, and a further two degrees of freedom for the definition of the interface plane normal. So this is an illustration of how these five degrees of freedom matter. So here we have two crystals in different orientation. These are the unit cell axes, and this is the interface plane. Recall the five degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom, because we can change them independently. So for example, I can change the orientation of the interface without changing the relative orientations of the crystals. So obviously I've changed the orientation of the interface plane, but the crystallographic orientations of the bicrystal are exactly the same. Alternatively, I can go from here to here, maintaining the interface plane constant, but changing the relative orientations of these two crystals. So there are, each interface will have five degrees of freedom uh, three of them defining the orientation relationship between the two crystals and two for the interface normal. Whenever we do these operations, the structure of the interface will change. So you would not expect the structure of this interface or this interface to be identical to that. Okay, and just to illustrate that, this is a transmission electron micrograph of a crystal which is enclosed in a matrix. Okay, so this is a, a dark field image, so you don't see the matrix, but it's there surrounding this crystal. It's a thin foil. Um, and you can see these periodic arrays of dislocations in the interface between this precipitate and the matrix. But notice that when the orientation of the interface plane changes, we are not changing the relative orientations of the precipitate and matrix. But when the orientation of the interface plane changes, the periodicity of the dislocation structure also changes. And even maybe the Burgers vectors of those dislocations might be different. Okay, so these are real structures that we actually observe in the interface because these dislocations have strain fields and those strain fields can be imaged in a transmission electron microscope because they give rise to local variations in the lattice parameters so the diffraction condition is altered. So we can identify the dislocations and we can even measure their Burgers vectors uh, by doing something called a, a G dot B analysis, which I don't want you to worry about. So I mentioned that the reason why we see these dislocations is because they have strain fields associated with them, just like a normal dislocation has a strain field associated with it. So I'm just going to go through a procedure where we calculate the strain energy due per unit length of a, an isolated dislocation. Um, okay, first of all, uh, this is just an illustration of Hooke's law where the stress varies linearly with the strain and uh, the area under the Hooke's law stress strain variation gives us the strain energy per unit volume which is half sigma times epsilon and I can replace sigma by the elastic modulus so it's half elastic modulus times epsilon squared. I made a mistake here. There should be a half, obviously. Okay, so that's the elastic strain energy per unit volume. Now, um, the reason why I'm explaining this is Elastic strain energy varies directly with the modulus and with the square of the strain. So let's see how this uh, 
concept of elastic strains that we did for monotonic uh, tension applies to something as complicated as a dislocation. I'm going to oversimplify the method that Volterra used in 1902, but I just want to get the gist of things over rather than uh, actually calculate the strain field of a dislocation. So imagine we have a cylinder and we slice it uh, halfway and we displace the two halves uh, relative to each other so that they're still connected in this region but not here. Uh, and the magnitude of the displacement is the Burgers vector B. So if I unwrap, unwrap this cylinder, then it will look something like this, where B is the magnitude of the displacement, and this is the height over which that displacement has happened. And therefore the shear strain gamma is B divided by two pi R. And as usual, uh, you know, if you, oops, start again. Okay, so let's use that concept uh, of the monotonic tension and the strain energy associated with that to think about dislocations. And let's imagine that we have a screw dislocation here. And uh, it's a cylinder, a cylindrical element, and we have sliced it and displaced one part relative to, other, uh, to the other. And this is basically the calculation that Volterra did back in 1902, but in a much more rigorous way than I'm going to explain. Uh, so this is the magnitude of the displacement B, the shear uh, displacement, and this is the radius of the cylinder. So if I, if I now unwrap that cylinder, then um, you get something that looks like this here. Uh, and B is the displacement over this distance two pi r, which is the circumference here. So the shear strain gamma is simply B over two pi r. And by analogy with the calculation that we did earlier, the strain energy per unit volume will vary with the shear modulus times the shear strain squared. Now, since gamma is proportional to B, uh, it follows that the strain energy per unit volume will also be proportional to GB squared. So this helps us uh, to understand the equation for the strain energy per unit length of a dislocation, uh, which is over here. Uh, this is the strain energy per unit length. This is the energy of the central core of that dislocation per unit length where you know basically elasticity theory doesn't apply and in the example that i illustrated uh, in the previous slide we calculated the shear strain uh, but we need to integrate over over the radius uh, radial vector so this is the integral from the core radius to however however long a distance the strain field of the dislocation extends and this, of course, is a familiar term, GB squared. Nu is um, the Poisson's ratio. We are doing this now for an edge dislocation. Uh, so when you integrate uh, the right-hand side, you end up with something that looks like this. You know, we have a dr over r here. Therefore, we end up with a log term. Uh, r naught is the radius of the core of the dislocation, and r infinity is the distance to which the strain field of the dislocation extends. Okay, so we need to um, take some guesses for these values. Well, we can set the core radius to approximately the Burgers vector. And this is a bit more uh, sophisticated. Now, we are not interested in an isolated dislocation, but in a dislocation, which is present in an array of dislocations in the interface. And of course, these will interfere, the strain fields of these dislocations will interfere. So here we have a region of tension and here we have a region of compression. So they partly compensate each other. And very approximately, 
the strain field of these dislocations extends to a distance which is the separation of the dislocations along the interface plane. Okay, so, so we can replace R infinity by uh, D, the spacing between the dislocations in the array of dislocations. And uh, just to remind you here, um, the misorientation theta, the Burgers vector, and the distance are related by this equation. So uh, the misorientation theta is inversely related to the distance between the dislocations because you know if theta is small, then tangent of theta over two is simply theta over two. So we are setting R infinity to equal D uh, and from this relationship to equal the Burgers vector divided by the misorientation here. And R naught we are setting to the magnitude of the Burgers vector, the core radius. So going back to this original equation, it now becomes this, okay, where we've replaced R infinity by D and R naught uh, by the Burgers vector B. <clears throat> now, because uh, uh, D and theta are inversely related, if I replace D by theta, then I end up with a minus sign in front of log of theta, not log of one upon theta. And this equation can be simplified to uh, this simple, uh, this form where A and B are constants, theta is the misorientation. So we now have the energy per unit length of a dislocation line in an array of dislocations as a function of the misorientation theta. So we have this equation uh, once again, which is the energy per unit length of a dislocation uh, in an array of dislocations defined by the misorientation theta. Now, suppose uh, that we assume there's a unit length into the, uh, into the board and we work out the number of dislocations per unit length along this direction. And of course that number is just one upon the spacing D. Then multiplying this equation by one upon D gives me the interfacial energy per unit area. Uh, so in this equation, we have the interfacial energy per unit area in terms of the magnitude of the Burgers vectors of dislocations, the misorientation theta. Very powerful equation is telling you how the interfacial energy varies as a function of the misorientation. So if we now plot that equation, it looks, it looks like this, that the variation in interface energy per unit area is rapid initially, and then becomes more gentle. Ignore this for the moment. And the reason, of course, is that the interaction between dislocations as they approach each other in the array is large initially and then becomes smaller uh, as they are close to each other. Eventually, it becomes meaningless to use this calculation because the core overlap doesn't allow you to use elasticity theory. And roughly speaking, uh, this equation will break down when theta is about 15 degrees about the tilt axis. Now, this is an interesting feature, which sometimes happens that as you increase the misorientation, you get a sudden collapse in the interfacial energy and in other properties such as the diffusion coefficient within the boundary. So there's something special going on at particular values of theta. And what's happening is that when we have two crystals, when they rotate with respect to each other or, or their misorientation changes, you might get circumstances where a fraction of the lattice points from both crystals coincides. So I'm going to show you a simple experiment which demonstrates that at certain special misorientations between two crystals, uh, a fraction of the lattice points from both are exactly coincident. Uh, and in this case, I'm using two dimensional crystals, a pair of hexagonal uh, crystals, uh, and they share a common origin, 
So when I change the misorientation, you see some interesting things happening. So here, for example, if you look at this uh, orientation, uh, there is there are points which are in exactly the same place for both of the lattices, as you can see here. Okay, and furthermore, uh, if you look carefully, these coincident points actually make a pattern, and that pattern is different for different misorientations. So here, for example, is another pattern with a higher density of coincidence points and, and so on. So at certain special orientations, you will get a fraction of lattice points from both crystals which occupy the same position in space. And these points are called the coincidence uh, points and the pattern in which they occur is known as uh, the coincidence site lattice. I'll use another example now to illustrate this, where we'll, we'll have two primitive cubic lattices interpenetrating and filling all space from a common origin. So here uh, is one uh, of the primitive cubic lattices. And we are going to generate a bicrystal by placing another one of these uh, primitive cubic lattices at a common origin but rotated 36.9 degrees about 01. And you can see that here. And it's easy to see that there are several locations, for example, here and here, and let me see here, where the two lattices share, uh, the lattice points from the two lattices share exactly the same position in space. And they form a pattern which is called the coincidence site lattice. Now, the dimensions of this CSL unit cell uh, are, you can work them out by looking at, at this vector relative to the vectors of the primitive cubic lattice. So this, for example, is two, one, two, one, two, one, oh. So, the magnitude of this will be, you know, two squared plus one squared and the square root of the whole lot is root five. And similarly, this is root five. And uh, along the vertical axis, the axis about which we tilted the crystal, uh, the dimension is just one. So the volume of the, uh, of the black cell here is root five times root five times one, which is five. Whereas the volume of the primitive cubic lattice is just one. So the CSL cell has a volume which is five times bigger than the primitive cubic cell. And that's because uh, a fifth of the lattice points in either one of the yellow or the gray cells, a fifth of the lattice points share exactly the same position in space. Okay. Right now, if we look at what happens at these sites, I've already given you uh, a clue that, you know, if we have a high density of coincidence points, then the interface energy is likely to be low. And uh, there's a bit of uh, terminology that since one fifth of the lattice points are common to both of these lattices, we say capital sigma equals five. Now in this plot, we have the interfacial uh, energy per unit area, initially varying according to that equation we derived earlier, but then dropping sharply at particular angles. In this case, it happens to be a 70.5 degree rotation about 110. And uh, that gives us one third of the lattice points common between the two crystals. And at this particular cusp, we have one eleventh of the coincidence points common to both crystals. So the interfacial energy here is not reduced as dramatically as when we have one third of the lattice points coincident. Now, we need a method of 
calculating capital sigma uh, because we can't always draw diagrams. The misorientations that I've shown you are fairly simple to observe. So I need to tell you a little bit about rotation matrices and coordinate transformations. So in this slide, uh, we have a vector u, uh, which in this space is A, where we have the basis vectors A1, A2, and A3. We'll have uh, components u1, u2, u3, which in this case are 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is the vector u in the basis A. Now, in the basis B, this vector u has different components. It's the same vector, same magnitude, same direction, but because the basis vectors are different, its components are zero to one. So we need a method of transforming the components from one basis to the other, one crystal to the other. Okay? And the way we do it is it's actually quite simple. We express the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis vectors of B. So A1, for example, is along here and is simply B1 plus B2. So we have 1B1 plus 1B2 plus 0B3 and so on. And then we arrange these as the columns of a matrix. So the 1, 1, 0 come over here, bar 1, 1, 0 here and 0, 0, 1 here. And this is a coordinate transformation matrix. And this equation here is simply a matrix representation of this set of three. So this is a row vector containing the basis vectors of A1, A2, uh, basis vectors A1, A2, and A3. And this is a row vector for the basis B. And these are these components arranged in columns. So each column of this matrix, which we'll call BJA, represents the components of the basis vector of A with respect to B. So if I multiply this matrix by, for example, uh, the uh, 1, 0, 0 of, uh, of the basis A, then I will get 1, 1, 0 in the basis B, which is exactly uh, the definition that we've created. So BJA is a coordinate transformation matrix and you can multiply it by any vector in the basis A to obtain the information from the basis B. Uh, and this is the equation that we would use. This is a column vector now. Uh, so that is a coordinate transformation matrix. Now, if we set our bases so that both of them are autonormal, that means uh, they have unit magnitudes, uh, the basis vectors have unit magnitudes and the angles are all 90 degrees, then this becomes a rotation matrix with all the components, uh, all the rows and columns corresponding to a unit vector. If you take the sum of squares of the components along a column or sum of squares along there, you'll end up with one, okay? So that's called a, a rotation matrix. And a general rotation matrix, if you know the axis of rotation and the angle of rotation, is this, uh, where u1, u2, u3 are the components of your axis of rotation. Theta is the right-hand angle of rotation. So um, m is cos theta, n is sine theta. And this is a general a matrix in which you can plug in any value of theta and any rotation axis and you will uh, get your rotation matrix immediately. And <coughs> prove to yourself that the sum of these three, in other words, the traits of the matrix, uh, simply gives you one plus cos two theta. So from the rotation matrix, you can derive the angle of rotation, right-handed angle of rotation. And if you look at these terms here, then you can derive the um, magnitudes of the components of the unit vector, which represents the rotation axis. Now, this is not a memory exercise, okay? Um, you would never be expected to remember this, uh, and I'm not going to derive it. However, if you're interested in its derivation, 
then look at Appendix B of the book, uh, Geometry of Crystals, Polycrystals, and Phase Transformations, where uh, it is actually derived. Now, I'll show you that only do this if you're interested because it is a little bit um, lengthy, okay? So the derivation requires a little bit of knowledge about the similarity transformation and, and so on. So I don't expect you to follow this up, but if you want to, the information is there, okay? And that gives you how to derive that matrix. Okay. Um, so given, given the axis and angle, we can derive a rotation matrix. Right, so uh, going back to this slide, uh, we can easily calculate the rotation matrix for a 36.9 degree rotation about 100. And there's one further thing I, I, I want you to note. Um, that is a vector, a primitive lattice vector of that yellow primitive cubic lattice. And we have here the lattice vector of the other cubic lattice. And if, if you simply work out the components of the basis vectors of one of these lattices with respect to the other, then you have your rotation matrix or use that general equation that I gave you. Now, if we look at primitive lattice vectors, they will of course have integral indices. And the coincidence site lattice generated from a primitive lattice vector of the cubic lattice of the elementary cube will also have integral indices. So this is uh, the, let's say the one zero zero of the gray cubic lattice. If I simply take five of those, then I end up, whoops, so Daisy, then I end up with the coincident side lattice vector, which is five times bigger, okay? So supposing that I've derived my rotation matrix relating the yellow and the gray lattices, okay? And if I simply multiply by a vector from one of the lattices, I generate a vector, the vector components in the other lattice. But if I take a vector from one of the smaller lattices, multiply it by five, and then multiply it by the matrix, then I generate a vector of the coincident side lattice. So, that very simple rule that you know if you have a vector which is integral in the uh, in in this lattice for example and i multiply it by five i will end up with another vector which has integers and is a vector of the coincidence side lattice okay so um we've derived let's assume we've derived the um, rotation matrix relating the yellow and the gray that is 36.9 degrees rotation about 01. And you can show for yourself that if you take components of one of these basis vectors with respect to the other lattice, you will get this, this, and this. Now, if I take, if I convert the fractions, all the fractions in there into integers, then the common factor is one fifth. And that one fifth is one upon sigma. Okay. So the sigma value is the same as this five. So if you have any rotation matrix and you find a common factor that converts all the elements of that matrix into integers, then you've got your sigma value. Okay? Because the common factor, one upon that common factor gives you the sigma value immediately. Uh, and in the example we had of uh, a rotation of 70.5 degrees about 110 for the sigma 3, this is the rotation matrix after we've taken the common factor out and therefore the sigma value is 3. So it's very simple to calculate 
the sigma value given a rotation matrix. Okay, okay that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you very much.